I'm simply saying to you all that this, I did. It just did not happen. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that was Attorney General Christian Porter identifying himself as the minister accused of raping a 16 year old girl in Sydney in 1988 when he was 17. And telling journalists. Nothing in the allegations that have been printed ever happened. They just didn't happen. In February last year, the alleged victim made a complaint to New South Wales Police. But in June 2020, she took her own life, the day after asking the police not to proceed. So, with the case closed and no chance of the allegations being tested in court, friends pushed her claims into the public eye, kicking off what Christian Porter and others have condemned as trial by media. Mr Porter saying he's become the victim of a trial by media. This man has had no natural justice and has had trial by media. Unfortunately, it is a trial by media at the moment. What we've seen is trial by media. And in the four corners you may just have seen, the revelations have continued as the pressure on Porter has mounted. So, has it in fact been trial by media? And has it been unfair? Should there now be an inquiry to throw light on what happened? These are some of the questions we'll try to answer tonight in a special programme. But let's go back to Friday 26th of February when ABC Four Corners reporter Louise Milligan lit the fuse. I can reveal that the Prime Minister's office, uh, the Greens Senator Sarah Hansen-Young and Labor's leader in the Senate, Penny Wong, were all yesterday sent a letter from anonymous friends of a complainant of a sexual crime who alleges that a um, sitting cabinet minister raped her uh, decades ago before he entered politics. The shockwaves from that ABC bombshell spread far and wide, with the allegations making front page headlines in the weekend papers around the country. And for the next 48 hours, we heard only one side of the story, as the cabinet minister in question stayed silent and did not deny the allegations. So come Monday, it was left to the prime minister to do it for him. The individual involved here has, has vigorously rejected these allegations. It was by then an open secret in Canberra that Christian Porter was the minister accused. He'd been identified by a couple of fringe news sites and his name was trending on social media. Indeed, Media Monitor's stream found mentions of Porter's name on Twitter jumped by 500% the day after the ABC broke the story, then doubled from Sunday to Monday and doubled again on Tuesday. And by Tuesday afternoon, there was a tweet naming Porter every six seconds. So on Wednesday, Porter bowed to the inevitable and revealed himself to the media, denying the rape claim absolutely and complaining in carefully chosen words. No journalist has ever put the detail of the allegations to me in a way that would allow seeking a response. Not ever. All I know about the allegations is what I've read in the media. By that time, plenty of journalists had in fact contacted his office for comment. As 3AW's Neil Mitchell, the Herald's Kate McClamont and Crikey's Amber Schultz made clear, only to find their calls and emails went unanswered. But Porter's complaint, his office said, was that the ABC had not put the allegations to him before publishing. And indeed they, and others who followed, had not. So why was that? The ABC told us Milligan's report was about the anonymous letter and it had sought and received comment from the people to whom the letter was sent, including the PM's office. But the letter alleged Porter had raped a young woman in Sydney in 1988. So why was that charge not put to him? The ABC says it's not usual practice to seek a response if an individual is not named. And today, Louise Milligan had another reason, telling RM Breakfast... We didn't know whether the Prime Minister had identified to the Attorney-General that this letter was about him. So it, we were advised that the proper thing to do was to send the questions to the Prime Minister and that's what we did. That is all very well, but many in politics and the media knew it was Porter and it was highly likely his name would come out. So we believe he should have been given an opportunity to deny the allegation from the start even if he might have chosen not to do so. But does that omission alone make the coverage unfair? In my view, no. Nor does it mean the rape claims should have been ignored by the media. Yet that is the line taken in several news stories, editorials and opinion columns in some News Corp papers and by hosts on Sky After Dark. Right at the start, the Australian's front page story headlined the fact that the family did not want the rape claims broadcast. 
And after he faced the press last Wednesday, the Telegraph's editorial backed the AG by highlighting what it called... Porter's trial by media ordeal. And describing it as graceless, unedifying behaviour by ideologically driven journalists and media persecutors. The Australian's editor-at-large, Paul Kelly, branded it a shameful day in our politics, without parallel in decades, if ever. And News Corp columnist Andrew Bolt called it a crazed witch hunt, railed against the foul mob and warned none of us is safe. And over on Sky, also owned by News Corp, the mood was just as hostile. Trial by media is obscene, and so is trial by politics. And when they work hand in hand, truth falls victim to vengeance and justice is tossed aside for headlines. If you are deeply troubled by all of this, you are not alone. I studied the, the crucible at university. This is, this is Salem witch hunt stuff. And as they all complained of trial by media, Andrew Bolt began his own trial, but with the deceased victim in the dock. So I ask, is it possible that this mentally ill woman was acting under a delusion? What else did she invent, dream or mistake? Andrew Bolt also started sifting through the evidence to uncover what he called ABC mistakes, starting with a claim in the dead woman's dossier that she and Porter had danced at the Hard Rock Cafe in King's Cross on the night of the alleged rape. The first Hard Rock Cafe in Sydney, in Darlinghurst, did not open until 1989. A full year or more, it was in April 1989, a full year later. This woman's account is wrong in that respect. And what else in that statement? A very detailed statement, says the ABC, is wrong and was not checked before publication. So, was this a killer blow? Hardly. While there may have been no Hard Rock Cafe in 1988, the famous Osrock Cafe in King's Cross certainly existed, with dancing on the floors above. And former News Corp journalist Malcolm Farr spoke for many in a tweet quite obviously aimed at his colleague. The understandable confusion after 30 years between the Hard Rock Cafe and the Osrock Cafe can't be used to discredit the woman's overall claims. Only fools and the deliberately malicious would. Hey, what do you know? But next night, Bolt was back with another attempt to discredit the victim. And soon his disputed claims were being recycled as fact by others on Sky to suggest the woman's account could not be believed. We now know that in relation to the woman's complaint, there are at least two errors in it. Uh, we know the Hard Rock Cafe wasn't open when she said they went dancing that night. We know that's wrong. And we now know that when she said in her statement, one of her statements that Christian Porter put her in a bath, we now know there was no bath in her room. So we know that's wrong. Again, not quite. The woman alleges Porter made her take a bath or a shower. And a police investigation would, of course, have tested those and other claims. But there is now no prospect of that ever happening. As John Sylvester wrote in The Age... The criminal case against Porter is not weak. It is now non-existent. The complainant has not made a police statement, cannot be interviewed as she has died. The alleged offender has denied the allegation. There is no forensic evidence, no witnesses, no crime scene and no CCTV. And so the trial by media has continued, with News Corp's Daily Telegraph using body language experts to assess Porter's denials. As one told the paper... The overall presentation of himself and his message seemed genuine. And soon the punters too were delivering their verdict on Talkback Radio, clearing the Attorney-General. It's just a, a Me Too thing going on here. 30 odd years ago, nobody knows this, nobody knows that. It's, yeah, you know, it's just rubbish. Or claiming he's guilty. Was I listening to Prince Andrew or was it uh, Christian Porter? They sounded like the same sort of uh, interview. I can look at people and I know when they're lying. On social media, the debate was even uglier, with Porter found guilty on all charges by the vast majority of tweeters, despite his vigorous denials, which led Chris Yulman to complain on Nine. It's all played out in the media and the vile sewer of social media for clicks and political point scoring. So, how did this treatment compare to what the media dished out to Bill Shorten in 2014, when he too faced a historical rape allegation from the 80s? As the AG told Wednesday's press conference... I think a difference for the former opposition leader was that for him, while the police process was on foot, the entire Australian media left the issue to be dealt with by the authorities and did not start an attempt to conclude a public trial by media. And on that, Porter is right. After the Australian broke the shortened story, on its front page... ALP figure faces 80s rape claim. 
Merely identifying a senior Labour figure, there was far less speculation as to who it might be. And for the next 10 months, the mainstream media stayed quiet until Shorten outed himself. Shorten speaks out about rape allegation. Shorten, I was rape case figure. Opposition leader is cleared of rape claim. And Shorten's admission was then mainly met with sympathy. Christine, do you think it should be over? Absolutely, I think it should. It is, it's a personal matter, it's been investigated and Mr Shorten has been completely cleared of any wrongdoing, so it's, it's finished and it should stay there. So, does this show media double standards? Sky's Chris Kenny says it does and puts that down to political bias. Journalists accepted legal and reporting standards in that case but are applying different standards now over a case involving a politician on the other side of the aisle. But there is one massive difference. Bill Shorten was interviewed, investigated and cleared by the police. And the complainant, who is still alive, got to tell her story in News Corp's Herald Sun. Porter has not been cleared because the complainant died before making a sworn statement, so New South Wales Police could not rule on whether her claims had merit. But, all that aside, maybe times have changed, as Patricia Carvelis and Frank Kelly mused on the Party Room podcast. Maybe there has been a shift in our thinking, maybe even, dare I say it, maybe a positive one, which says that the level of accountability we expect from our political leaders is different. So maybe if I can be really controversial, perhaps Bill Shorten should have stepped down while the police were investigating. I think that's right. And perhaps if, if we were doing this now with Bill Shorten, I think there would be a different response. Some in the media would take it much further than that. Nine's Jessica Irvine channelled the rage of many Australian women when she told today... Where there are men in Parliament who are the subject of these claims, I, they are not good enough for their jobs that they're irreplaceable. Okay, and I want the Prime Minister to take a stronger stance on I this. And I can tell you, for 50% of the population, we do not want people who have been accused of such things. That is surely going too far and would be a denial of natural justice. But with Christian Porter adamant that he won't step down and the PM supporting him, where do we go from here? That was the question journalists were asking last week as the AG faced the music. How do you process, Mr Porter, to allow due process? Should there be an independent inquiry by a retired judge, as there was in the High Court for Basin Hayden? You say that you're innocent and that these allegations um, uh, came as a surprise to you. Uh, why wouldn't you support an independent inquiry that would then clear your name? One strong argument for a proper judge-led inquiry is that it would provide a hearing to the complainant and a chance for Christian Porter to clear his name. And it would reassure sexual assault survivors, like The Guardian's Amy Ramikis, that their voices will be heard. You have an inquiry so people have faith in the system, uh -huh. so people know that their voices are going to be heard and going to be treated seriously. Because why does a denial, why is that louder than someone saying, this happened to me? And the parliament hasn't worked out how to deal with that. And if they can't, how do we expect anybody else to move forward on it? But the Prime Minister is adamant there will be no inquiry claiming that anything except a prosecution, which of course is now ruled out, would undermine the rule of law. There is no other alternative for a Prime Minister than the rule of law. There's not another process. Porter's supporters in the media, most of whom are at News Corp, echo that view. On Peter Credlin's show on Sky, the Australian's Paul Kelly backed the PM's decision to reject an inquiry by saying... I think we're talking here about a star chamber. And his host agreed. I can't remember a more important moment than this today, when as a country we will decide if 800 plus years of legal fundamentals are to be upheld or abandoned. And pushing even further down that path, the Australian's Chris Merritt warned that the judicial inquiry risked unleashing anarchy. If a media frenzy can strip the Attorney General of the right to be judged by the normal law, then nobody is safe. How long would it be before a Trump-like populist emerged promising to drain the swamp of those who ignored the presumption of innocence and sought to manipulate the law. That is just nonsense. And most legal experts are not convinced the rule of law is threatened. In fact, Sydney University's distinguished Chalice Law Professor Ben Saul argues an inquiry would ensure, not undermine, due process. And Barrister Fiona McLeod agrees, telling the ABC... 
you have investigations and inquiries in an employment context, in a disciplinary context, in a human rights context, which can apply different rules to the criminal justice system and come to a outcome, findings and recommendations that have the potential to clear Christian Porter and potentially to resolve on a different standard of proof the sort of um, issues that are now unresolved and, as I perceive, will not go away. We see that process happening in the sporting and corporate worlds all the time. And many ask, why should we not see it in this case? Indeed, as the complainant's lawyer, Michael Bradley, told the ABC... In the absence of such an inquiry, what is the media going to do? Well, it's going to conduct exactly the trial by media that Mr Porter was saying we should all abhor, and I absolutely agree with that. But it's going to happen if, if the allegation and his response are not you know, tested in a proper formal um, process. But unless the government backs down, the most we're likely to see is a coronial inquest in South Australia, which the PM has said he would welcome. That would investigate why the woman took her own life and could examine her mental state and her rape claim. And it's what news.com.au's political editor, Samantha Maiden, who knew the woman well, would like to see. So personally, I mean, what I would like to see is a coronial inquest. I think that there is a strong argument that the justice system has failed uh, not only uh, the alleged victim, but Christian Porter, because he has not been given the opportunity to be interviewed by police, to provide an affidavit, uh, to have witnesses come forward. Meanwhile, more details were revealed by several outlets on Friday and Saturday, and a row blew up after Crikey's David Hardacre suggested that the woman's memories of the alleged rape had been recovered through therapy. That was angrily slapped down by the woman's supporters, who pointed to her diary notes from 1991, in which the alleged rape is mentioned. So, the debate and the ordeal for Christian Porter continues, as it does for the friends and the family of the alleged victim. And as the wily old politician Graham Richardson told Sky on Thursday, there is only one way to make that stop. The only way that you're going to get rid of it, the only way that it won't be appearing on the front page every second day for the next few months, is to be able to have an inquiry, make it quick, sharp, to the point. So, to go back to where we started, has it been a trial by media? Well, yes, it has. But in the circumstances, that is not surprising. These are serious allegations, and they have been managed badly. Porter and the Prime Minister could have gone public on day one, welcomed an inquiry, and said they were confident it would clear his name. Had they done that, it might have been very different, especially if the media had faced threats of legal action for defamation, which it seems Porter has not made so far. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream or download the programme and read the statement from the ABC. And don't forget, Media Bytes, every Thursday, online and on social media. But for now, until next week, goodbye. If you or someone you know is affected by any of the issues raised in this program, please contact the following services. Lifeline 13 11 14. 1800 RESPECT. 1800 737 732.